Okay, so welcome everybody <laughs> to uh, another cheese and wine pairing event with me and uh, Patrick McGuigan, this time for WST School in London. Some of you might have been to some of our actual events at the school in, in Bermondsey Street, uh, where myself and Patrick have uh, collaborated with the Academy of Cheese um, to bring you some different events and um, we recently collaborated, didn't we, Patrick, for a, a project that you were doing, the British Cheese Weekender? Yeah, that was uh, not last weekend, but the weekend before. So three days of online talks and tastings to try and support uh, sort of artisan cheesemakers in the UK who are having a tough time a bit. And you and I did our usual uh, cheese and wine routine, which was great fun. We, uh, we, had, we only had half an hour, though, so it was quite a we had to sort of rush through it so it'll be nice tonight to have a bit more time to to talk about it, the, the matches we've got absolutely right sorry i'm just um responding to a couple of inquiries in the chat uh you, yeah so there is a school zoom but that's just blank it should just be me and patrick that you need to so lydia harrison you can pin or spotlight our videos it should come up uh, and we've got a few slides for you to see as well so patrick if you find patrick and just pin his video that means it should come up on your screen it's just because we've got two presenters but hopefully if you if you can find those okay um so uh, yes welcome everybody just to explain um a little bit about who we are first of all then we'll get on to our cheese and wine pairing so um my name is lydia harrison i'm a master of wine and a full-time educator at the wst school in london on bermondsey street um, and we do all qualifications in wines, spirits and sake from level one, a kind of beginner, and then uh, through to level two, level three to the diploma in wines, our level four qualification. Um, and we do some spirits and, and sake qualifications as well. And I also organise the evening events here, which we're now doing online. Uh, and we have done some cheese uh, and wine tastings before with Patrick. And it was a real uh, natural fit, wasn't it? When we started working with the Academy of Cheese that also do qualifications in cheese, uh, parallel sort of level one, level two, etc. Um, so yeah, it was a real natural pairing to team up and do some some wine and cheese events. And Patrick, you can introduce your cheese guru self. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Master of Cheese does not yet exist, although it's coming. Um, so I'm Patrick McGuigan. I'm a, a food writer. I'm a cheese writer. There aren't many of us in the country. Um, I write for people uh, for, mag uh, for newspapers and magazines, uh, like the Telegraph, uh, the Financial Times, Delicious. Um, and I also, uh, I'm a, a cheese educator. So there is uh, an, an organization called the Academy of Cheese. You can see it on the, uh, on the slide there, um, which was set up a couple of years ago now to, it was a sort of cross industry um, collaboration. So, you know, cheese mongers, cheese makers, cheese wholesalers came together to set up a, an educational qualification similar in some ways to the WSET so we're on we, we've we've I think there's been about 1500 to 2000 people who have taken level one um, which is a one day course uh, and then we launched level two last year I teach both those courses um, and eventually we'll get to level four which will be master of cheese um, we're working on, on, I work with the academy to sort of put together the, uh, some of the, 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 the coursework and, and so on. Um, and we're working on level three at the moment, but it's all been held up a bit. Um, but when you put, when you, I just have to show, cause I know you're a master of wine, Lydia. So I thought I'd bring my badges just to, um, <laughs> you know, just to try and compete. So when you, when you do level one, you get a little, a nice little pin badge like this, which says uh, you're an associate at the Academy of Cheese. And when you get to level two, you become a fully fledged member and you get a, a sort of brown one. So, um, yeah, I mean, at the moment, sort of teaching has stopped. It's generally done live, you know, in a classroom. I work for the School of Fine Food quite a lot and we teach uh, near Borough Market, actually. But we're looking at going online as well and, and doing some of the courses um, so you can actually sign up and do a few evenings a week with me. Or another tutor um, online so that's coming yeah I should obviously say uh, we, we're also offering our qualifications online at the moment as you can't uh, get to the school at the moment um, someone's asked are the cheese qualifications just for cheese makers or cheese aficionados 
No, I mean, it's a bit like WSET in that level one of the, the Academy of Cheese is, is open to everyone. So we, you know, we have, I've taught lots of members of the public who are just quite interested in cheese. You learn, um, initially you learn about 25 key cheeses, things like mozzarella and parmigiano reggiano and cheddar, the sort of the basics. Um, and we have a, something called a structured approach to tasting, which I can talk about later when we're actually trying some cheese. But um, yeah, members of the public, we have cheese mongers, we have cheese makers, we have chefs. Um, but what's been interesting is how, when it was set up, it, we thought it would be quite, in, it would be the industry that would be really want to take these qualifications. But actually it's the public. And so at level two, which is a, a two day course and requires a lot of home learning, we've seen, um, yeah, I mean, it, half the classes have been full of members of the public who just really want to learn um, more about cheese, uh, which is quite exciting. And, you know, who knows, people start out as just sort of keen enthusiasts and end up opening a cheese shop or becoming cheese makers. <laughs> that, that would be brilliant, you know, if that happens. It's just, it's um, just the same with the wine world where people come and do a wine course and then want to want to join the, the, the wine industry. But yeah, it's just, we're the same at our level two qualification. It's about 50% in the trade and 50% just people that are enjoying wine. So... Interestingly, Lydia, a lot of the people who are coming on the uh, on the academy course mm -hmm. have, have have done a, quite a lot of the WSET courses. There's quite a lot of crossover. Yeah, well, I mean, um, who doesn't like wine and cheese? I mean, <laughs> it's a natural pairing, right? <laughs> and there's so many similarities in you know both fermented products. There's this sort of agricultural terroir link um, that we're uh, you know that we've we've talked about in previous talks that you know they're, they're, they're both sort of linked to the land in a similar way and sort of encapsulate particular areas and geographies absolutely but we also get competitive uh, about where the wine or cheese wins don't we yeah well <laughs> I, when you say we Lydia you mean you <laughs> um yes yeah, so we thought I'm incredibly laid back you know if the wine tastes better I'm happy to admit that you bought your badges <laughs> um yeah. <laughs> so anyway, if uh, we thought we'd start with just sort of covering some of the basics, because some people will know about wine, but not so much about cheese, like myself or vice versa. So we thought we'd just look at some of the ways we assess cheese and assess wine, and then look at how some of these things that we assess can can work well together. But also, we we just thought you know join in. We've got our cheese boards here. This, I've brought mine, as you can see. Look at oh, that's excellent. Like that. Um, but it's really just about experimenting as well, and and having fun and trying the different wines with the different cheeses so yes yeah, so i'm just going to teach you how to taste cheese first of all well so what you can see on the screen there is the level one um it, uh, this is how we, we we assess formally assess the cheese and you learn this at the academy of cheese and actually it's very useful i do a lot of cheese judging there are such things as international cheese awards uh, particularly the world cheese awards where you have to taste your way through dozens and dozens of cheeses in a few hours and so getting into like with wine I imagine you go to lots of tastings Lydia and you have to kind of get into a rhythm yeah. of how to properly taste because it could be the, the the tenth cheese you try is an absolute world beater and so you need to kind of get a, um, a, a system in place so you can see on the screen this is the form we fill out this is just for level one level two gets even more involved but you can see we've sort of break it down into a sort of the rind, the, the paste and the interior. So to begin with, when we look at a cheese, when, when I first get a cheese, often I won't know where it's from. If it's a, if it's a, a competition, for example, you don't know, often it's blind judging. So you can tell a lot just by looking at a cheese. Um, you can t learn a lot from the rind, but also looking at the paste. So we would visually assess the cheese first. I've got a, a little goat's cheese here that I'm, going to try first and i know it's a goat's cheese or i can guess it's a goat's cheese even if i didn't know it was because of its its brilliant white color which is a sign goat's milk is very white in color goats can't absorb um a pigment uh sorry goats do absorb a pigment called carotene which is in grass um and so their cheeses tend to be uh, very white in color um carotene is the same pigment you would find in carrots um so cows um, can't absorb it and so their milk is very golden so you often see sort of 
uh, cow's milk cheeses that are made in the summer when the cows are out at pasture is very golden in colour. But just by looking at this, I can sort of guess it's either a goat or a sheep because um, it's, it's sort of brilliant white. And then also you can see it's got, I don't know if you can see that quite a sort of white bloomy rind, which is also telling me um, something as well. So we would assess the rind, we would look at the paste and the interior. So texture is really important in that's some beautiful cheese modeling you're doing there, Lydia. Excellent. I know, well, we've got the same Good. one. So I thought, you'd... <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have. So the, yeah, this is the larger cheese. <laughs> um, it's uh, like a Pac-Man if you hold it that way. Um, so. <laughs> This is uh, made by uh, Sharpen, who are based down in Devon. But um, and what you would also look at texture. So as well as visually assessing the cheese, you'd, you'd, you'd use your fingers, you'd use touch and give it a good squeeze. Um, and, and get. it's quite important, actually, when I'm writing about cheese, <laughs> um, that you really pay attention to texture because it's a really key part of the eating experience. Um, so flavour is is really important, but um, texture is, is a key part of it. And I suppose that's true also of wine, but I think even more so in cheese. So, you know, we can look at, if you look at the paste interior section there, we have word, the consistency section, we have words like moose-like. That's um, not, not the animal, we're not, we're not, we're not assessing. <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> but you know, some, some of those goat's cheeses have very, um, uh, almost sort of fluffy, moosey textures. Um, you can get dual textured and actually I would say this cheese um, which is called Ticklemore you can I don't know if you can see just under the rind it's slightly darker and yeah. slightly softer and then in the middle it's sort of crumblier and, 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 and sort of firmer but I would describe this cheese as being dual textured um, and what's happening there is the mold on the outside is breaking down the cheese just like it would with a brie or a camembert but because this is a firmer cheese, it's not going to go completely gooey, um, but it, it definitely will have different flavour profiles and a different texture. So it will be a bit more sort of fudgy under the te under the rind, whilst I can see from the interior, I've not even tasted it yet, but you can see it's kind of crumblier and, um, uh, yeah, and more, and more compact at the same time. Um, so then we would smell, um, and you can get, the rind on this cheese has quite a funny aroma, I think. Are you getting that, Lydia? It's got a sort of almost fishy. Yeah. And then, if, not... like you said, it's dual textures. I really, there's like a clear line in mine where the, the centre is one, one texture and then the, the rind is almost a bit more kind of translucent. And <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, that's, different. translucent is a good way. Yeah, it sort of becomes, and goes almost a bit sort of green in colour. Yeah, like yeah. Sort of, uh, while it's still brilliant white in the middle. Um, We'd call that two-tone. You see it with as a, as a cheese. Actually, I've got it here. I didn't um, realise cheese was so fashionable. Um, two so this is Gore with Kefili, and you can see the same thing going on here. Yeah. They're quite similar cheeses, actually. This is goat's milk, and this is cow's milk. But you can see that darker band where it goes two-tone. And you get lovely sort of mushroomy, earthy notes from under the rind. You can see on the Gore with, it's got a really lovely mixed rind, lots of different moulds and perhaps even some yeasts and stuff growing on there. Um, and they, they sort of change the texture of the cheese. So then we would smell and on level one we're just looking for is it like a, a high intensity or low intensity and you look out for things like ammonia which you get with very soft cheeses when they're a bit overripe they can smell a bit like uh, well like like urine basically uh, to, Probably. <laughs> to, but I mean and that if, if it's very high in ammonia that's kind of would be considered a fault and then when we taste at level one at least we um we we just go for basic families of flavors we go for the five basics so sweet savory acidity salt and bitter and then we look at families of flavors and so sort of dairy fruity floral vegetal herbaceous notes mineral chemical which could be uh sort of you sometimes get metallic notes in blue cheeses would perhaps fit into that and then animal fungal fermented so that's sort of those farmyard flavors mushroom and sometimes you get really like funky washed rind cheeses at level one we, we just go quite basic it's quite entry level at level two we start going into specific flavors so we might identify dairy but then say okay are we talking yogurt or cream or butter 
or clotted cream and, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's how we taste it. We use all, so it's sort of sight, uh, touch, smell, and then taste. And as you said before, the rind or the outer parts can taste quite different, can't they, to the, the inside as well. So you almost have like different parts of the, the cheese with different tasting notes. Yeah, and on level two, we have, a, we, have, we have sort of areas to write notes on that. So you would actually, you know, for flavours, you might have an area where you make detailed notes on you know, mushroom and earthy under the rind, lactic and, uh, you know, lemony in the centre with a, you know, and, and also comment on the texture. So fudgy near the rind and, and, and brittle and flaky near the centre, for example. Really? The thing is with cheese, Lydia, where, you know, where cheese does trump wine in many ways, <laughs> is that you have a one vintage for wine, unless you're blending and doing cuvées, and I suppose, but typically you have, so that's like a year in a bottle, basically. Also, cheese constantly changes. When you're talking about artisan, uh, small scale cheese makers, it, it literally changes day by day. If you're making cheese every day, it depends what the weather was like outside, which bit of the field the animals were, were grazing, you know, if they're grazing on nettles and wild garlic, it will impact the flavour. If they're, if they're on clover and grass, it will impact the flavour. Uh, if they're in the shed eating hay, that changes the flavour and texture. So literally every batch is like a vintage. And it can be quite frustrating. You think you know a cheese and then it's completely different the next time you taste it. I, and I quite like that. It's quite fun to... You never really get on top of it. Yeah. Um, I think wine is the same, but just more in an elongated way, like as it ages or vineyard to vineyard yeah. comparisons. So yeah, let's just have a quick look at how to taste uh, wine and then we're going to get on to our, our pairings and we can talk through some of these taste things as, as we go. So... Uh, oh, just, sorry, this was... <laughs> That's the World Cheese Awards there. Just to give you an idea, when you're tasting, you, I'll, that, a table there at the front would be like, uh, that's what I would have to taste through in about three hours. Yeah. Um, and you can, I just wanted to show you, we use often with big cheeses, rather than if we want to grade them and test them before they're ready, we use something called a cheese iron. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Which is like a sort of a knife, which you can see um, uh, Morgan there from uh, Trithowans. You plunge it into the hard cheeses and take then you can take out a core of cheese and really assess it um anyway let's get on to the wine yeah so just similar as you said certain we will as we got the levels we ask people to be more specific about what flavors they're tasting uh you also mentioned the mousse which is funny because we're going to taste a sparkling wine and when we talk about mousse it's like the texture of the bubbles uh, in a wine but yeah just wanted to highlight some of the things this is our level two um SAT systematic approach to tasting and um, and yeah as you can see just to highlight some of the key things we won't go through everything like color and that that's not so crucial to, to cheese and wine pairing but what is is a flavor intensity so on the nose and the palate we'd say is, is something pronounced or quite delicately flavored and I think when you're matching that with food if you've got you know a wine that's really intensely flavored you want a cheese that's going to, to stand up to that um, another key thing is sugar and we're going to finish up with a sweet wine um, and that's something that can work uh, very well uh, and acidity so we have different levels of acidity and that's what makes your mouth water when you're tasting wine uh, the acid in the in the grapes and in the wine makes your mouth salivate and that's something that we'll look at when pairing as well as the body so um, you, you talked about different textures in the cheese Obviously with wine, it tends to be more sort of a uniform texture, but the body is the mouthfeel and that can be contributed by alcohol, tannins in red wines, the sort of bitter drying sensation that you get, flavor concentration and sugar will all give more body to a wine. And again, I think that's something you can think about when you're pairing with any food really is, is the texture and light, really sort of delicate wines work well with dishes that are kind of lighter and then if you've got something really heavy and rich and mouth coating you want you want a wine with some some texture to it as well so just to draw, uh, touch on some of the things we'll talk about and and then equally yeah flavors we split them into primary which are things from the grapes or fruits um herbaceous things herbal notes secondary so things from wine making so oak aging or lees aging or dairy characters and then tertiary from development so things like leather or nuts or dried fruits as well but yeah i think we should get 
get cracking on to our first um, pairing. I've, we'll, I've started we'll, already, Lydia, I do apologise. <laughs> yeah. And I'll um, come back to this as well, what we'll discuss it as we go through. So, yeah, so we've, we've got the semi-hard goats first. Yeah, so this is the one I was sort of waving around earlier, um, <laughs> which is, uh, it's called Ticklemore. It's a great cheese, actually. Um, it's, it's, it's one that I come across every now and again. Um, but I don't get it out. I live in Brighton uh, in Sussex. So this is, uh, you can see that's the Sharpham Estate uh, in Devon. It's quite near Totnes, a beautiful place. And they make wine, some really nice English wine, actually. We tried their barrel aged wine last a couple of weeks ago didn't yeah. we on our last we talk which was i thought was delicious mm. um and we tried that with they, they also do uh, so they make a lot of goat's cheese uh, and they also do they have their own jersey herd as well and they do a really nice creamy uh sort of uh a bit like a brie but they add extra cream so they call it a triple cream called elmhurst and that's what we matched last time was we tried uh, the sharpen uh, barrel aged with their Elmhurst and that was a great match it, mm. they're not wines I normally drink where they're sort of oaked and but it, it it had that sort of roundness that really went with that very rich cheese and so talking about that body thing that that the white that their sharpened wine because of the oaking seemed to have a kind of a richness to it is that right Lydia I mean yeah that, that absolutely and um, so yeah winemaking techniques can can add to the body of the wine and that's certainly something um to consider though the wine i have with this one is a bit more of a kind of classic pairing it's sauvignon blanc with goats which um is something that's kind of a quite quite classic pairing you know they make a lot of goat's cheese in the loire valley in france which is where sancerre and Fume of sauvignon blanc wines come from i've actually got a, a new zealand uh, sauvignon blanc here so this one doesn't have any oak um, is really kind of crisp and fresh and fruity, but I think that works with, you know, the, yeah, like the, the slightly lighter texture of goats. And then, it, yeah, if you have something rich and creamy, like you said, a brie or cambo, which we'll come on to, then, then um, wine making where you have some oak or some lees aging or something can, can match up to that texture. But this is, so Ticklemore, which is a cheese I'm trying from, uh, from Sharpen, is, uh, is an unusual one. It's not like the Loire Valley goat's cheeses. Um, no. it's, we, so the Loire Valley goat cheese, you call them sort of lactic cheeses. Mm -hmm. And what that means is just you, you add your starter cultures to the milk and then you leave it, the milk to acidify over a really long period. So there's like the, it's, it's sort of almost ferments by itself without the addition of rennet. Um, but you do typically they add a little bit, but they will leave the milk in, in those Loire cheeses like, like, um, Saint-Maur de Terrain, um, and Crottin de Chavignol, which are like, and Volance, they're all from the Loire Valley. So they, they leave them and then add a little bit of rennet at the end. And they sort of, they tend to have quite wrinkly rinds and they tend to sort of break down and be quite rich and soft uh, and then get, and, and, and the rind really breaks them down and they become quite gooey underneath. Um, and this is not like that. This is almost a bit more like a Caffili tickle more. It's yeah. almost like a caffili made with goat's milk. So it's sort yeah, of like crumbly goats. crumbly goat's milk. So it's quite unusual. You know, you'd expect yeah. these cheeses to be made with cow's milk, like the caffili I was showing you earlier, mm -hmm. or like, um, or, or even something like, like uh, it's a bit like a ton de savoir as well, if people know that French cheese. So there's, there's mold action on the outside of this cheese, but because it's firmer and crumblier, you don't get the same kind of gooey intensity. So it remains, it's a nice balance, I think. It's uh, the center's nice and zippy and lemony and lactic. And then the, round, the, round the rind is quite sort of mushroomy. But they balance out quite nicely. But with, I'm actually drinking some fizz with this. I've, I've, I've not got any still. Wine. Yeah, I think, I think you can um, alternate the first two pairs. Yeah, it, you. We, I'm doing Sauvignon and then fizz, but you could definitely switch them around because what we found always works is the acidity which is so crucial and sodium block has lovely bright acidity that just kind of cleanses your palate so whether it's the, the more kind of creamy traditional goats or this it's just a lovely cleansing afterwards it just sort of washes away um the cheese but it also yeah i think it really brings out the the citrusy notes you're talking about citrusy characters in, yeah. in this cheese and i've got a quite punchy new zealand sauvignon blanc the, the ned which and, and usually like 
quite more overt than your Loire styles and quite passion fruity. But with this cheese, it sort of brings out some of those sort of lemon citrus characters as well and the, the really lovely fruit. And we've talked before about sometimes wanting similar flavors to work together and sometimes you like the contrast. And I, I, yeah, I think this has a bit of both. You've got the kind of citrusy characters in both, but then you've also got the kind of mushroom savoriness with the sort of slightly more exotic fruit as well. So yeah, I, I really like it. I think this chicken was in a really good state at the moment. It's really yeah. nicely, actually, if we'd, because we, this has been in my fridge for about a week or so. Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's matured quite nicely in the bottom of my fridge and broken down a little bit. That, the, the, the white moulds that you can see on, on these cheeses and, and you find them on camembert and uh, brie is, is, a, is, a, is a type of fungus called Penicillum um, camemberti, or sometimes known as Candidum. Um, and so when you see that, you know, that, that, that mold will work on the paste of the cheese. So with soft cheeses, it really breaks them down. And, and you get, you know, if you think about a brie de mot, it will just go all the way through and you'll just have beautiful goo. But <laughs> that, that action um, creates interesting flavors. So, you know, these cheeses are living, breathing things and that you actually have a living organism, the, the, the fungus on the outside is actually changing the cheese over time so even in my fridge you know this is this cheese looks quite different to a week ago which i think is like it's, yeah you know, you're kind of doing your own cheese maturing at, at home um i'll talk a little bit more we have a softer <laughs> cheese later and i'll talk a bit more about how that works and what you can do at home to make sure your cheeses are in good nick because actually the domestic fridge is not a very nice place for cheese you know they like cool damp cellars oh, and domestic the same as wine is, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's so many um, But yeah, fact, what, what, what I, I did is the going, Sorry. Go on, Lydia. Sorry, you go. No, no, you no, go. no, carry on. I was just going to say the Crottin de Chavignol, those classic Loire French cheeses, um, the, the, the caves that they aged those in were originally wine caves, but when Phylloxera hit France and took out all the vines, they had these wine caves where they didn't know what to do with them for a while, and so they put cheese in them, and, and Crottin de Chavignol is... You know, so there is that link, that, that really yeah. historic link between uh, cheese and wine in that part of France. Oh, definitely. Uh, and yeah, I mean, they, the same goes for the wine. You want some humidity and uh, you don't want it to be too dry or too hot or too cold. Um, and uh, yeah, the Tufo in the Loire, the Tufo rock, it's a sort of really good temperature control. Um, and yeah, they'll store the wines under and in the same cellars as well for them to mature. So... So many crossovers. Um, right. Shall we, shall we move on to the next pairing? Uh, yeah, some questions, some questions coming up. I, I saw something about where is the Academy based? I yeah, think. I think Tracy's on it. Tracy's um, answering Tracy's some of that. So I'll leave, I'll leave that, leave that to, to her. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, I think you can experiment, but I think definitely if you have sort of creamier style cheese or goats then a, a, a white wine uh, with acidity and some sort of fruit flavors sort of so non-unoaked -oak, uh, usually I think is, is a good pairing I think that always complements quite well. I like uh, someone's asking is Riesling a good pairing? pairing yeah goat? similar exactly also also aromatic high acidity uh, would work so yeah I mean you just uh, like there's no right or wrong you have to, to, to kind of work out what you like but yeah, I definitely think the kind of the aromatic fruit flavors of, of Sauvignon Blanc or Riesling and, and like you can see pictured uh, and the high acid, I particularly enjoy with those sort of, would you say creamy? Maybe not creamy for goats, but sort of mouth coating, you know, the way it comes. Yeah, no, they are yeah. not so much tickle more, but those, those kind the of, normal, the, classic, sort of yeah. the goat log, you know, or yeah. the little pyramids and those, they are, they really coat your mouth. They're very sort of, um, uh, they are creamy. I, I mean, there's a word that's overused and I'm always moaning that everyone <laughs> describes every cheese Sorry. as being creamy. Um, but actually, they genuinely are. And so there's something, uh, having that acidity to pierce through is really good. I like those northern Spanish and, and northern Portuguese wines. Um, is it like Verdejo and um, Gordello? Yeah, it's very similar. Verdejo is very similar to Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. Equally, I, I put as an option, I thought it was a bit niche, but if you were really sort of into British wines, Bacchus is quite similar as well, sort of yeah. really herbis, herbaceous, and a lot of English wines have really high acid anyway, naturally, because we're a cool climate. So anything from a sort of more cool climate and really kind of fruit forward, I think, 
Alberino even, you know, would work with that sort of style cheese. All right, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Just, you just can... a quick question, Lydia. Why, why yeah. was there a load of uh, fruit and, and vegetables on the... Uh, on the... Well, that was just some of the typical flavour characteristics that you, you get with some oh. of your plant. Okay, sorry, just, you know, just check it. Uh, yeah, so that was that's why I put those images. It just sort of you, rather than just put a bunch of grapes, I thought those are sort of fruit characters or what we call primary characters, things like green bell pepper, asparagus, grass, citrus, everything through to sort of stone fruit, tropical fruit is what you can you can get with Sauvignon Blanc. Someone's someone's asking about does cheese have to be served at a certain temperature? Well, yeah. And yeah, ideally you want to be getting your cheese out of the fridge at least an hour or so before you eat it. Um, it really, it's a bit like a red wine, you know, having a really complex red wine. If you kept that in the fridge, opened it and drank it, you lose it. The cold really suppresses the flavour. Yeah. So uh, pretty much every cheese benefits from getting up to room temperature. Um, having said that, there are no rules. So if you like eating cheese out the fridge, then eat it out the <laughs> fridge. I mean, I'm a great one. Uh, you know, if 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 you wanna, if you wanna. If you like it a particular way, then go for it. You know, it's it's meant to be fun. And, and it's the fun. same with wine as well. I mean, we would recommend normally a sparkling or a sort of lighter white, really cold. Um, and then if they have more oak aging and stuff, a little bit, a little bit warmer, something like thirteen degrees, just so that you don't mute any of the flavours. But you know, if it's a hot day like today. You sometimes just want something really refreshing. So and, and red wine in the fridge is a thing, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah, when you get absolutely. a kind of light Pinot Noir or a. Yeah, um, Beaujolais, or something like that. Beaujolais, Valpolicella, very typical. Um, so what what do you have? This is a, a yeah, brie. Yeah. I've actually got a camembert, which is actually... A You've brie. got a camembert. It's a very confusing slide. Um, yeah, so um, I've got a Sussex camembert um, from, from Harrison's, which is a British-style camembert. You can see there, so again... Which, which one have you got there? Sussex camembert. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's from Old Sop and Walker, I think. Yeah, um, and... Um, and Hold that up again, Lydia. That looked like that's got some good. That's that's nicely matured. That isn't it? Yeah. Is that gooey all the way through. Then is it? It was my sister's shop, so she um she said she'd pick me out one that was in, in prime condition. <laughs> that looks perfect because actually you can see. So I, I, I've I've said, yeah. So is there, is there still a little bit of chalk in the middle there? Yeah, there it? was. Yeah, there was some chalk. I trimmed it off to make it look nicer. <laughs> <laughs> She's styling. I love it. But someone's asked with these, could you, would you eat the rind um, with these sort of stuff, soft style cheeses? Yes, 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 definitely. Um, so let me do, the, the slide is extremely confusing. So I've got, I'm actually eating a Sussex, another Sussex cheese uh, called Flower Marie, which is, um, uh, a sheep's milk bloomy rinded cheese so you can again you can see using our new cheese uh, skills that you there's that white mold again so this is penicillin camemberti that's doing the, the breakdown but it's much softer than the tickle more um, and it's much more in that sort of brie uh, and, and and camembert style but it's made with sheep's milk and and then i put a picture of brie de mo on the slide just because i wanted to show talk a little bit about when are these cheeses right and when do you eat them? And do you eat the rind and all that sort of stuff? So you can see that picture of Brie de Mo, which is sort of the, the classic raw milk French cheese, which is made, Mo is a, a, a village in just east of uh, Paris. And that region is a protected, so Brie de Mo is protected. You can only make Brie de Mo in that region and it has to be with raw milk. But if you can see on the slide there, there's, you can sort of still see a slightly chalky centre to the cheese, whilst sort of around it, it's really broken down. So that, again, that's that, that mould working on the, um, the paste, but because it's a higher moisture content cheese, a softer cheese, it really breaks down. And so give that cheese in the picture another week and it would be full goo, like the one you've got, Lydia. Yeah. Uh, so, and that is, you know, and so I suspect what, what what are you getting off that when you smell it and taste it? What kind of flavours are you getting? I'm not the best at describing, but yeah, it's a really different texture to the the sort of crumbly goats. It's very smooth, um, mm. and yeah, there's really quite the the rind is really quite strong, sort of mushroomy. Is that right? The word or sort of almost meaty, like quite savoury. Um, mm. 
Right. When you say mushroom, what kind of mushroom? Well, like cook, cooked mushrooms, you know. Yeah. Girol or something, a bit earthy. That's it's. Yeah, it's definitely. But then the the middle middle part tastes very very different. But yeah, I would say it's got sort of stronger flavors than the goats, um, and, and quite different. And that's why actually we're we're looking at this um, with a carver. Uh, and I often, I think, as we mentioned before, people often don't think of sparkling wines with cheese, but I actually I really enjoyed the last time we did an English sparkling wine with a, a goat's cheese, which I thought went really well. This time we've got um, a carver, but you could have a champagne or uh, an English sparkling wine. But the, the key with this is it's traditional method. So um, you can see on the picture on the right, it's got some, some lees aging. So those, that sort of white sediment there, the bottom of the bottle, it's actually a rosé champagne, but same with your whites. They age it um, on those dead yeast cells and that imparts this sort of bready, pastry, biscuity, uh, sometimes, you know, the longer it can go more toasty or kind of nutty with time um, characteristics. And I actually really like that flavour comparison with, I probably described it incorrectly, but that, that sort of more intense flavour that you get on the, on the, um, the chamomile that I have, um, is it also has nice acidity, your sparkling wine, so it's kind of cutting through the kind of quite richly textured center of the cheese, but you've also got this added texture from the winemaking of the, the carver, which I think kind of complements the bit more intensity of the, the, the camembert. And carver, like you say, is also protected. It's a little bit different. Um, most, most wine regions in Europe, they're protected are quite niche. And carver is actually quite a large area. And you can actually make it in different parts of Spain, which is unusual for, for a wine region. Me and Patrick actually have the same one from, from the co-op. We, were, we didn't have anything in, in the house. But it's, it's nice. It's yeah, incredible. it's actually it's good. incredible value, this wine. Yeah. It actually, it's a very nice wine. Often own brands can be really good value. You can taste a little bit of that kind of delicate kind of bready characters. And yeah. then it's got the traditional Spanish grapes of uh, Macabeo, Charolo and Pariada, and they give sort of a bit of pear, citrusy notes, but it's less in your face fruit than the Sauvignon, so it's just a bit more delicate, but with that sort of bready um, lees aging as well. And I think that I enjoy I that. that, was, that soft I don't know how much you paid for yours, Lydia. Mine was about six pound fifty or something. Which yeah, was... no, it was the only carver I could find at like about nine p.m. last night when I was trying to prepare for today. But that's it... right. I mean, it's got a lot of flavour that for for that price. I'm getting a lot of sort of apples. You know, that mm. sort of like this appley, but definitely a bit of toasty action as well. Going yeah, on. it's sort of like pastry and apple. People often say things like apple pie because you've got the slightly sort of fruit but you've also got the little pastry character as well so the cheese the cheese i'm trying is is um so this flower marie so sheep's milk is 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 extra rich and has a kind of sweetness to it i love sheep's milk cheeses and people always just think of manchego but and, and pecorino but there's there's been a whole wave of sort of british uh sheep's milk cheeses that kind of borrow from what they've seen in France or Italy and then sort of taking them off in weird directions. And, and Flower Marie is, is one of those. So it's a square, also cube shaped uh, sheep's milk brie, I suppose. I mean, you, it, it's really unusual. Um, sheep, sheep's milk is incredibly rich. So it has about twice the butter fat of, of cow's milk. Um, and it has, sheep's milk cheeses always have a lovely sort of sweetness to them. Um, which I really, really like. And there's actually, if you look at the British Cheese Awards um, over the past few years, it's sheep's milk cheeses that have won, that have been supreme champion the past three years, I think, from a company called White Lake. And there's something about that sort of sweet, sheepy, they have a slight animal thing going on as well, which is quite nice. But with the toasty notes and the apple and toast and the sweetness of the milk, so the apple toasty notes of the wine and then the sweetness of the milk, it's a, it's a really lovely, really lovely. Yeah. I really enjoy that one. So you um, more, more sparkling wine with cheese. I actually think a lot of people wouldn't think of it at the end of the meal, perhaps, um, you know, in British culture. But I, I think it's actually really nice. And it's a kind of lighter pairing, isn't it? You know, the carver is like only 11.5%. It's not anything too heavy. And it's, it's actually a really nice sort of palate cleanser as well. I mean, because I th the thing with cheese is everyone always just thinks you have cheese at the end of the meal. Yeah. Or if you're French, you have it before pudding which is what I do. Yeah. I always have cheese before. <laughs> Me too. Because I'm always worried that if I have the pudding, I'll fill up too much on the pudding and won't have room for the cheese, which would be a disaster. Um, so I always have the cheese, like the French do, you know, after the main course. But actually, if you go to Spain, they, they often have a glass of 
uh, fino sherry with some manchego or a glass of cava, um, you know, with some cheese before the meals begins, like an aperitif moment. And I do that more often now. Is actually I have cheese before, sort of while I'm cooking often, um, as as just a little snack, uh, as a little sort of entree, really. Um, and so with sparkling wine works really well at that point. So. Well, that's what we're doing now. Obviously, we haven't had dinner yet, so we're starting with wine and cheese. <laughs> and really? then we'll have yeah. <laughs> right, let's move on um, to the next one. I think we've got slightly different versions. I've still got some of the pitchfork cheddar that we had last time, which you can see is really golden and aged. Uh, beautiful. And you should commend me for actually managing to keep it for two weeks. There's not, there's, I know how big that wedge was, though. It Lydia. was. Yeah, we've definitely <laughs> we've made a dent in it. Um, are we? This is. Are we going red with this now? Yes. So um, I'll go through the wine first with this one, shall I? So this, yeah, go for um, it. What I have here is um, some Vacaras. So this is um, Domaine Le Clos de Cazo, which is down in the southern Rhone. Um, obviously, you don't have to have the exact same wine, but Cote de Rhone, Chateauneuf, the Pape de Gondas territory. Uh, so I've got a Vacaras and. When we look at red wines um, with cheese pairing, often they're obviously from black grapes, hence, hence the picture. And, and you use the skins when you're making the wine here. You can see all the colour pigment there is in the skin of the grape, that kind of bluey purple colour. And when you're using the skins in the winemaking, that's going to transfer um, colour, but it's also going to transfer tannin. And that's sometimes what actually not everybody enjoys with cheese because tannin dries out your mouth and it dries out your teeth and your gums. Some people can find it quite bitter um, and certain foods can bring out tannins and make it more stringent. So if you have very spicy food like chili, that can really make the wine seem even more drying. And for, for some people, then that's going to be unpleasant. So if you had like a really spicy cheese, uh, equally, if something was really savory, like lots of that umami flavor and not enough salt to counteract that, then it's going to sometimes bring out the the tannins um so what i've gone for here is a kind of ripe bread so obviously we're in the southern rhone it's a warm climate lots of sunshine and the impact of that on the grapes is to ripen the skin so you get really ripe tannins it makes them sort of less less astringent and nice and ripe texture on the palate it also ripens the flavor and it gives you a lot of sugar in the grapes it's going to give you some alcohol so yes we've jumped up here from 11.5 to 14 and a half but this is a red wine, therefore, with some body, okay? It's got lots of texture, and, and therefore, it's going to suit a cheese that also has some flavor intensity and some, some you know, texture and strength to it because the, the wine does. This has got a lot of uh, ripe flavors from the grapes. It's a traditional blend of Grenache, Syrah, and Mourvedre. Um, so lots of kind of ripe berry fruit. It's also had some thyme and oak, so that's going to add texture and flavors of kind of clove, cinnamon smoke complexity and then it's this is uh, 2015 which was a, a great vintage in the southern Rhone a really fabulous warm year lots of sunshine so you had lots of uh, good fruit um, but it's got five years age as well and if you age this longer it's going to develop a bit more of that kind of leather dried leaves tobacco some of those other flavors so it's a really complex wine as well and Again, go you know with the parallels with the cheese. This is kind of like an aged, well-aged cheddar or some you know matured Comte or Gruyere, where you're also getting that you know flavour, complexity, and intensity, so that when you taste the wine, you're not just tasting the wine and not really the cheese, or vice versa. Those the, the intensity of those flavours stand up to each other. Um, so yeah, cheers. I'm going to to taste my vacaras. It's rather delicious. Well, I, I haven't got a vac. I'm not that posh, but I've got. I have got a Grenache from the the uh, Pace Dock, um, and it it's really good. It's got a lot of cherry notes, sort of like, but sort of licorice and cherry, like dark cherry notes going on. Um, and so the cheese, Lydia's uh, got a, a a farmhouse cheddar from a Somerset called Pitchfork, which is about twelve months. Um, I've gone for something a bit stronger, which is called Double Barrel. Um, and so the name kind of sort of says it all, really. So you, people might know a cheese called Lincolnshire Poacher, um, obviously made in Lincolnshire. Um, and uh, Double Barrel is the sort of the vintage version of it. So Lincolnshire Poacher is aged for sort of 14 months plus. Double Barrel is more like two years. So they take it on and it aging 
uh, cheddar in this way, you, the, the flavors intensify and become stronger. Um, particularly with these kind of cheddars, which are sort of more traditionally made, a lot of supermarket cheddars are wrapped in plastic and uh, when they're aged, they don't really lose any moisture as they age. So essentially you end up with quite a squidgy cheese. So if you know any block cheddar you buy from the supermarket is quite squidgy. But this is made with a with a kind of you can see the pictures there on the um on the slide so they make them in sort of truckles which lose moisture as they mature uh, and as they lose moisture the, the the texture becomes a bit firmer a bit snappier and the flavors intensify so double barrel is like it's full on two-year cheddar just you can see the cheese maker there um his name's richard tag uh who's the head cheese maker, he, uh, he, he plays the trombone as well, which I always think is quite a nice little uh, aside. And so when, he, when he's waiting for the, the, the milk to ripen, he'll go off and play his trombone for a bit. But what he's doing there is, is called cheddaring. Um, and so, you know, cheddar is made, uh, cheddar is the name of the cheese. It's historically made in the village of cheddar, which is in Somerset. It's also a verb. And what you do to cheddar is, is you, those are curds, you cut them into those loaves and you turn them and stack them. And as you do that, moisture is squeezed out, but also acidity rises. And so when you, you get a good, good farmhouse cheddar, which double barrel is, you get a really nice tang and that cheddar tang. And it comes from the cheddaring process that you can see happening there on the screen. Double barrel is a big, beefy number. It's got real muscles, you know. It, it's it's a it's a cheese that is kind of really savoury, but then also has this really intriguing sort of pineapple note of tropical fruit, which with this wine, the the the, the Grenache that I'm tasting from the paste dock, mine's fourteen percent, so it's got the body to stand up to the kind of savouriness of the cheese. But I'm getting like extra cherry from the wine, which I think the kind of fruitiness of the cheddar is sort of teasing out of the wine. So yeah, they're I... quite different separately. But when you taste them together, they both get sort of amplified in a really nice way. Yeah, and you always talk about that is like sometimes that's the, the ultimate goal, isn't it? Is to have the wine and the cheese that just sort of lift each other up. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying that. Like you say, it's almost like this sort of saviness is bringing out the sweet sort of strawberry ripe fruits even more of the wine but then you've also got the sweet spices a little bit kind of cinnamon clove uh complementing but they both got the the power and, and the muscles the the flavor intensity in the body and um, that is is sitting side by side nicely mm. so, uh, there's a few questions coming in Lydia there was a few people asking about what where can you buy good cheese in a supermarket? Yeah, Trent Tr um, did put in some of that, but um, yeah, the Academy of Cheese have put a list on their website, haven't they, of, of cheesemongers and things that are delivering direct and doing sort of parcels that you can get your hands on in the current situation. So uh, people don't, Tracy Colley, who's answering a lot of the questions on the, uh, <laughs> on the group chat, is um, she works for the Academy of Cheese. She's their operations director and is, was my partner in crime uh, for the British Cheese Weekender. Um, and she's right. Actually, supermarkets do a very poor job. Most supermarkets do quite a poor job with cheese. Um, it doesn't really fit in. Good cheese doesn't really fit into their distribution model, um, which is, you know, huge pallets delivered to central warehouses and then shipped all over the country. A lot of these sort of artisan cheeses need a bit of TLC. They need looking after and care, um, particularly the soft cheeses. Um, they really do need looking after and you need cheesemongers who are keeping an eye on them, smelling them. Are they, do they have too much ammonia or not? Do you need to cut that bit off? They need a, a bit of looking after them. It just doesn't fit with the supermarkets really. Out of all of them, as what, as Tracy says, Waitrose and Booths are probably the best. Um, but honestly, I would always recommend trying to go to an independent uh, cheesemonger or a farm shop or a deli where they just have the expertise to, you know, to, to look after these products properly. And also they tend to really look after the small cheese makers in a way that perhaps the supermarkets don't. Um, they have sort of close relationships with local cheese makers and it's just a bit more of a sustainable system really. 
And we found that with coronavirus and, and the lockdown is that actually the supermarkets really focused on big industrial block cheddar at the expense of some of their smaller suppliers. Um, and it's left quite a lot of small cheesemakers in difficult situations and they're being really supported by their, their local cheesemonger and farm shop and deli. So yeah, if it, I always try and buy my cheese from a, a good independent, um, for my own benefit really, because I just think you get better cheese. Really. Should we do the last yeah. pairing? Okay, we can do on. some um, questions at, at the end as well. And um, but yeah, yeah. Some, some crossover with, with wine. It's like anything, obviously you've got the, the larger produced stuff and then you have the more and more niche art, artisan. And, uh, don't want to get too too political but yeah we'll answer some more questions again let's look at our final pairing um and then yes you can you can say where you can some some recommendations or, or things for cheese so um i really enjoyed that but i i well the other thing i was going to say is salt in cheese is great for the reds it softens the tannins um and I imagine all cheese contains salt, but particularly in those really hard aged ones where you almost get those like crystals. I always love that. And it just makes the red wine feel even kind of softer, fruitier and, and, and richer. And it softens the acid and tannins in the wine, which, which I really enjoy. Um, and again, we've gone for a kind of classic one here, but you can go more unusual. We have done some, some other pairings and... Well, yeah, you haven't talked about your green tea and things yet, Patrick, but uh, we've gone... Uh, yeah, no, you, you always look a bit disapproving if I go <laughs> off wine, then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we've, yeah, we've gone, we've gone to Stilton mainly because I love it. And if I was going to have to buy some cheese for this, I wanted to be able to eat it. <laughs> and this is my favourite. Um, and then I've actually got some Madeira in the house, mainly because... Um, you can always have it in the fridge and it doesn't go off. So it's not like having to open a whole bottle of port and you need to drink it. Uh, so I've actually got some 15 year old Boile, which is like the picture there, you can see it's brown. Okay, this wine has had actually a white wine originally, but it's had such extended aging and in contact with oxygen that it has gone really dark in color, really deep sort of amber brown. Um, and these are fortified wines, so they've added alcohol. That's obviously going to give them body and texture, which stand up to the, the big blue cheeses. This is also sweet. So um, there's different styles of Madeira and just sort of basic Madeira, if you look for rich on the label, will be a sweet style. Otherwise, if it's got one of the great varieties on the label, they go up in sweetness. So Circeau can actually taste fairly dry. There is sugar in it, but it's, it's the driest of the, the four. Then you have Fideo, then you have Gual, and then you have Mamsi or Malvasia, which is the sweetest. It has about kind of port levels of sugar. Um, and the other thing we do is you have a cracking acidity. It's really mouthwatering. So I think that's going to work beautifully with the kind of creamy, you know, the the intensity of the the steel tip and it's just got so much flavor um but they basically do everything to this wine that you wouldn't normally do okay you heat it you oxidize it um so it's aged in barrels in the lofts on the island of madeira where it's humid it's hot so it rapidly sort of evolves so you don't really have fresh fruit flavors here everything you have is nuts sort of dates sultanas caramel toffee basically madarized um and it, that's a real contrast, I think, with the flavours of the, the blue cheese, but it just kind of works. It's like salted caramel. You've got the sweet and the, the, the salt, you know, the, these kind of contrasting flavours. So, yeah, tell, tell us about the Stilton, Patrick. So, um, uh, so Stilton is a protected cheese. So it has a, you know, like, like wine has AOC and... and we have some PDOs uh, that cover food, uh, European rules. And so Stilton is probably our best known protected cheese in the UK. Uh, so it can only be made in Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire and Leicestershire. There are seven Stilton makers. Six of them make blue. One of them makes, or six of them make blue and white. But and there's one that just makes white Stilton, which has its own PDO. The smallest one is Colston Bassett, and so the pictures you can see here, so Colston Bassett, uh, based in Nottingham, should take milk from just four farms. Um, and I just, some of the, I mean, I just, it's lovely to see just how handmade this cheese is. So if you see that sort of top left picture um, of uh, the two chaps with hair nets, um, sort of look like kind of ladles or um, colanders with handles, 
what they're doing is ladling the curd. They're hand ladling all of the curd from one vat, you can see the vat behind them, into another. And they do that so they can drain the curd. Most of the big Stilton make, it's like your sort of Texford, uh, uh, Tuxford and Tebbit, um, would, would just slot the curd down onto a table and the curd would get quite broken up to do that and then it would drain. These guys literally, by scoop by scoop, transfer the curd to a different vat, so a draining table, so they can preserve the texture of the curd and, and keep it uh, silky and, and, and together and, and retain the structure of the curd. And it really comes through in Colston Bassett Stilton. It's very silky and creamy, um, but then has these wonderful complex notes of sort of tanginess and also meatiness sometimes near the rind. Um, you can see how they're, they're putting it at the bottom left hand corner. So they've got the, the, the curd, they've milled it up, they've put some salt in and they actually pack it into those molds um, by hand. Um, and just finally, you can see them grading the cheese using their cheese iron, which I talked about earlier. As a much better picture, actually, you can see them. So they'll, they'll check that. Stilton normally goes out at sort of anywhere from 12 weeks onwards, but they'll test the cheeses as they're maturing just to see how they're performing and whether they taste good. Um, and Stilton's a classic. I mean, it's really, it's one of the great cheeses of the world. I think we, we, we should be proud of Stilton. <laughs> Um, in the same way the French are with Roquefort and the Italians are with Gorgonzola, Stilton is up there, you know, as, as the gr amongst the great blues of the world. And actually, I got a press release uh, a couple of days ago saying sales of Stilton have fallen 30% um, in the past during the coronavirus crisis. And quite a lot of Stilton makers, particularly these small guys like Colston Bassett and there's another one called Cropwell Bishop, are finding it hard because everyone's just buying cheddar basically mm. um, and so we need to be supporting these more speciality cheeses and particularly these smaller producers because the danger is there's only seven producers in Stilton and if we lose three or four of them you know we're in danger of losing these really classic British cheeses um, and they are just amazing aren't they I mean just and it's, it's for me it's such a seasonal pairing as well like Christmas isn't Christmas without we sometimes get like a whole round like half a Stilton just work on it for months you know with port um but, but Lydia I would say Stilton is for life not just for yeah. Christmas no no it's I like know but puppies. it just but like it, <laughs> I, I have it throughout the year but it's just like it just wouldn't be Christmas without yeah um, but I think and, all those flavoured when you when you were talking about, about the Madeira all the flavours that you mentioned just made me think of Christmas cake. So it's like raisins and, you know, yeah. like those molasses flavours and, and, and sort of sugary notes. And because a, a slice of a slice of Christmas cake with a piece of Stilton is is one of God's great creations. You know, it's a, yeah. one of the best matches. But then add in a, a glass of Madeira or port and you're just you're off into and Nirvana at that point. And you can and you can mix. Someone's asked like, would tawny ports work better than vintage because they're they're more oxidative, like the Madeira I was talking about. But equally, a vintage port is going to work well as well. It's also got loads of flavour, com complexity, and a bit fruitier. And, and someone else said they like a Muscat de Vaux de Venise with blue cheese. So, any I think the key here is flavour intensity. Um, and fortified wines often have that because they're usually from warm climates, and the winemaking processes usually add lots of flavour. And then I, I always just love that real sort of salt sweet. Um, combo as well but uh, do you have any particular dry wine recommendations for Stilton? Well I was going to say someone was asking about sherry about PX the Pedro Jimenez sherry uh, with blue cheese which I, I think is almost a bit it's a bit so too easy. much PX <laughs> yeah. PX is sort of like syrup really isn't it but yeah. I would definitely I've actually got I, I, I've got, um, no, that's my red wine. Hang on, what did I do with my, uh, oh, here it is. I've, I'm losing track of, I've got a, a Palo Cortado sherry, um, which works really well, which is sort of halfway between, like, well, you tell me, Lydia, you're the master. Halfway between a, a <laughs> well, Fino and a, an Oloroso. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And norm, normally they're dry, but obviously you can, you can sweeten them. But yeah, so again, you, if you don't want sugar, you could have dry, uh, sherry but just again with all that flavor concentration and some similar flavors that to the to the Madeira absolutely 
Or even if, if you don't I... want added alcohol, just, you know, pick a, a normal white or red, but, you know, it needs to have some, some, some intensity, <laughs> some oomph uh, to stand up. I mean, or even like you said, you said before, like beers and ciders and things, you know, it, it doesn't have to be just wine. You, you, can, you can go outside. Hang on a minute, Lydia, are we allowed to talk about beer and cider? I thought that was off limits. But yeah, if we're gonna, if now you've said the beer word, I would say blue cheese and, and, and stout and porter are just, it's an absolute fail safe combination. So Stilton with stout is just awesome because particularly if you get a milk stout, which has added lactose, which is milk sugar. So you get a sort of sweetened stout. And I like the fact that the, what they sweetened it with come, is a milk sugar. So it's, it's this lovely match. If you put that with a blue cheese, that works really well. Um, it, anything sweet with, with blue cheese is kind of going to work, I found. It, I actually did a tasting once where a woman came up to me and said, I don't like beer and I don't like blue cheese. And I said, try this blue cheese <laughs> with some stout. Um, and she tried them together and she was like, I... I like that's amazing. It's, I like together. <laughs> she liked them individually. She didn't. That's so um, but and so I, I, I felt like my work there was done. You know, that I, I could sort of, you know, I could knock off early on that one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, I think Sherry's. I love Sherry. Oloroso with um, with blue cheese is a good one as well because that sweetness. Brilliant. Right. Let me just. Um recap that I just put this slide up earlier and I think it's a, it's a little bit technical but it's just some of the key pointers you can take a screenshot if you like um, that we've sort of covered so if um, often if a food sweet you, you want a sweet wine because otherwise it can make the wine seem very dry and stringent but when it's the other way around when the when the wine is sweet with the savory you know unsweet cheese it, it can be work incredibly well but these are the things that are kind of a little bit more risky you're going to make your wine taste harsher basically bring out the acid and tannins so something to consider the good thing about cheese is there's always a lot of salt um which is wine's friend it's going to soften tannins and acidity and make things fruitier also acidity as well so high acid in wines is really good at cutting through fattiness in cheese or, or pairing with acidic things um, so yeah just some and then the flavor intensity that we've touched on as well is like kind of matching the intensity of the cheese and the, and the intensity of the wine um, so nothing kind of neither overwhelms uh, the other but um, yeah I mean obviously I think the key is experimentation as well isn't it obviously if you don't like sweet wine then experiment with well, what you do like and, and different cheese styles and nothing's really outside nothing's you know not possible it just depends on your preferences um, so <laughs> Tracy says well shalumi on the barbecue is calling her <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, we just, here's our details of, you've got the Academy of Cheese, if you're interested in cheese courses, you've got the WCT School in London for our wines, uh, spirits and sake courses, and both mine and Patrick's uh, details as well. I'll, I'll stop recording now, but we'll stay on and answer some more questions so you can get more outrageous. I was just going to say, before you, before you finish, Lydia, I'd just like mm. to say, um, I am going to start one of the new things I'm doing during the lockdown is I'm going to start doing some more online talks and tastings and possibly actually doing the Academy of Cheese courses online. It's something I'm looking to do in the next few weeks. So if people are watching, um, you know, follow me on Instagram and, and Twitter or drop me an email um, and, you know, I'll let you know about courses when they're going to happen. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it, it works quite well. So yeah look for yeah. me and I'll, I'll, I'll help you out with some, some cheese knowledge. And as soon as the school is, is back open for events, we'll definitely be doing some more actual cheese and wine tasting so you can taste uh, in person, not just watch me and Patrick eat cheese, <laughs> drink <laughs> wine on your screen. <laughs> but yes, thank you everybody uh, for tuning in.